This fantastic we explore the amazing jaw-dropping scientific discoveries which are revolutionizing our world and touching our lives and in this hour we're going to talk about one of the greatest discoveries being made in astronomy right before our eyes the discovery of not one not two but three thousand five hundred Earth-sized and Jupiter-sized planets orbiting other star systems in our neighborhood. And one of these star systems has seven, count them, seven Earth-sized planets going around it. Something which was once thought to be considered science fiction, impossible. Now we actually see these planets in outer space. With us today to explain all this is Professor Sarah Seeger of MIT, Professor of Planetary Science and Physics at MIT. You know, years ago, it was taboo to talk about this. In fact, in the year 1600, the former Jesuit priest Giordano Bruno was burned alive burned alive in the streets of Rome for claiming that there are other planets in outer space, perhaps planets that could have life forms on them. Well, he was burned alive in the streets of Rome, but today, centuries later, we are discovering planets at the rate of several every week. That's the rate at which we are celebrating the discovery of planets that were once theorized by Giordano Bruno, and now we actually see them in outer space. And then the question we're going to ask Professor Seeger is, does anyone live on any of these planets? What about the next generation of space telescopes? Are they going to be able to figure out the fact that perhaps life can exist on one of these exoplanets? This is Science Fantastic. The most up-to-date announcements and analysis from today's technological leaders every week on Science Fantastic. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. In this hour, we're going to talk about one of the big discoveries in astronomy, the discovery that there are now thousands, thousands of planets being discovered orbiting other stars, and one in particular has seized the imagination of astronomers. Seven, count them, seven Earth-like planets revolving around the dwarf star that is roughly 38 light years from the planet Earth. Well, what this today to help us understand this incredible discovery being made in astronomy right before our eyes is Professor Sarah Seeger of MIT. She's a professor of planetary science and physics at MIT, got her PhD from Harvard, and spent three years at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Uh, in fact, we overlapped. Uh, I was also at Harvard, and also I was also at Princeton, though not at the same time. She's also a winner of the MacArthur Genius Award in 2012, and Time Magazine, Time Magazine chose her as one of the 25 most influential figures in space in the year 2012. She's the author of two books, Exoplanets and Exoplanet Atmospheres. So, uh, Professor Seeger, thank you once again for being on Science Fantastic. Thanks, Michio. It's great to be back here. Okay, first question for you. How did you, as a youth, first get interested in science? Well, to be honest, when I was a child, I wasn't really that interested in science, but I did love the moon. I just remember being in my father's car, driving around, and the moon kept following me, and I just couldn't figure out why. A little later, I remember seeing the stars and just wondering, what are they doing? Where, what's happening out there? So I always had an intrigue with the skies. And did your parents buy you a telescope or anything like that when you were a child uh, to well, spark your not interest? Not really, but... It turned out when I was 16 years old, I got my first paying job, <laughs> my first oh. paying job in the summer. And believe it or not, I guess I must have been really interested in astronomy because I used the money I made to buy a telescope. Oh, I see. So you bought your own <laughs> telescope. <laughs> I, see. I did. And my dad helped me because it was super cold where I grew up in Canada, freezing. And you know, those clear winter nights are so spectacular. And I remember him freezing outside with me as we tried to figure out how to align the telescope properly. Uh-huh. And also when you were a youth... Uh, 
Uh, did your peers uh, think of you as a little bit strange, wanting to look at Absolutely. the stars? <laughs> Absolutely. I was supposed to get together with two other girls. I was about 15 years old. And I said, you know what? A supernova has been discovered. The, that was Supernova 1987A. Uh -huh. right. I can't meet you because there's a big celebration since the person discovered it is from our city. And I think they had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> I went no. to like a 1,000-person strong lecture, and they were, they were baffled. I see. They were probably clueless as to what, what a supernova was to begin with. Right. Okay. Well, let's just jump right into some of the discoveries being made in the area called exoplanets. Now, I remember when I was a kid, we learned that there were nine planets in the solar system. Since then, Pluto has been uh, demoted, so there are eight planets orbiting around the sun. But now we're talking about exoplanets, thousands of them. So first of all, what is an exoplanet? Well, an exoplanet is a planet that orbits a star other than our sun. Remember that our sun is a star, and we have planets, as you said, eight of them. And it makes perfect sense, right, that all other stars, other suns, should have planets also. And yes, indeed, astronomers have found thousands of them. Okay. Now, given the fact that these planets do not give off any light of their own, because they're not stars, they're planets, right? They must be very dim. How do we even verify the existence of an exoplanet? Well, believe it or not, we have about five different ways to find exoplanets. But right now, the most popular way and the easiest way is by transiting planets. We don't see the planet, as you said, but as the planet goes in front of the star, the starlight, remember, stars are just a point of light, the starlight drops by a tiny, tiny amount. And astronomers can measure that. They can measure that drop in brightness and measure the shape of the light curve, and they can der derive the presence of a planet. And I guess in that way, they can also detect the presence of multiple planets going around a star, right, if the starlight dims periodically. Right. If they have a precise measurement of the depth and shape of the transits, they can see multiple planets. Okay. Now, let's say uh, that we compile an encyclopedia of all these exoplanets. How many entries have now been entered into this encyclopedia? Well, believe it or not, our encyclopedia has different categories, so we could say we have about 3,500 planets. But uh, we actually have thousands of more what we call candidates. We haven't, like, confirmed them. People haven't had the ability, or some of them are out of reach to confirm whether they're really planets or not. We see a signal that looks like a planet, but we don't know for sure. So there's just thousands and thousands of them. Okay, now when we think of a planet in outer space, we think of something like Mars, but I guess most of these planets are not like Mars at all. They're more like Jupiter. Could you explain what do these planets uh, look like that we've discovered so far, most of them anyway? Well, the thing is, they're really all over the place. It's true there are a lot of large planets. We'll call them giant planets about Jupiter's size or mass, but there's a huge number of other sizes as well. There are planets, in fact, that have a size that does not correspond to anything we know about in our own solar system. Planets in between the size of Neptune, which is about four times Earth's size, and Earth's size itself. And we have planets right down to Earth's size and smaller. So in fact, we have planets of all sizes out there. Now, when I was a kid, I still remember that my teacher told us that our solar system is probably average. We're not sure. Our sun is probably an average sun. Our solar system is probably average. We have rocky planets toward the center, and we have Jupiter and gas giants toward the outside. Was that wrong to assume that we were average? That is wrong. And the funny thing is that it wasn't just your teacher, but it was common wisdom among even the top scientists, that our solar system was average. And today, we haven't found any solar system copies yet. <laughs> so of the 3,500 solar systems that we've discovered so far, uh, almost none of them are like ours. Is that what you're saying? That's right. In fact, just to be a little more clear about the numbers, <clears throat> we have about 3,500 planets and about 2,500 planetary systems. But one thing I have to say in all fairness is, you know what? Our solar system is actually very hard to find. The ones we found are just easier to uncover with our planet detection techniques. Uh, but nonetheless, our solar system isn't average or very common at all. It's probably somewhat rare. Okay. So the idea that we would have a planet, uh, t t planetary system where first the orbits are circular – that is, we have the rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, going around the sun in circular orbits. And then we have the gas giants also in circular orbits going around much farther distance. That paradigm has been pretty much shattered, right? Pretty much. I mean, we have a Jupiter where Mercury should be. 
we have an Earth 10 times closer to its star or 20 times closer to its star than Mercury is to our sun. Pretty much every combination of planet size and distance we have found. Okay. And also, uh, it was assumed back then, I still remember, that Jupiter, of course, was very far from the sun. And that's probably the way it was throughout the entire universe. The Jupiter-sized stars are going to be very far from the sun. But that's not true, right? We find wandering Jupiters. Could you explain? Well, when we see the Jupiters very close to their star, uh, Mercury's distance are closer or further away than Mercury would be to our sun. The thing is, we don't think they formed there. And that's simply because when we observe stars forming, they have a disk of leftover junk, like gas and dust, just that this didn't form into the star. We don't think there's enough material close to the star to form a Jupiter. So if the planet has Jupiter size or mass, we think it had to form further out in the protoplanetary disk, um, and as it somehow migrated inwards. So planets can actually migrate. Uh, this is something that, again, was thought to be rather absurd, but I guess that's the norm, right? Um, it may be the norm in some cases, but honestly, Micho, the whole thing is a mess. <laughs> we really don't. The more we find, the less we understand. So we're not really sure. Like, we have found planetary systems with several very small planets on the order of two times the size of Earth, and we're not sure how did those form. You know, did they, um, were they big and then eroded away? from the star's radiation, or were they formed in situ where they are now? Did they form somewhere else and all march in towards the star together? So we're just kind of trying to figure everything out. Okay, I remember when the movie Star Wars came out that a lot of astronomers kind of snickered a bit when Luke Skywalker looks in the heavens and sees a double star system out there. And some, some astronomers said that, well, isn't that rather unstable to have a, a planet going around two stars? But now I think we have planets going around three stars, right? So we have even more complicated systems being discovered. Is that right? We do. We do. We have a number of uh, what we call technically circumbinary planets. Yes, where the planet orbits two suns, two stars. And it turns out that as long as that planet is far enough away compared to the distance between the two stars themselves, it will be okay. Gravitationally stable, that is. Yeah, amazing. And now let's talk about Earth-like planets. We've talked about Jupiter-sized planets, planets that might even migrate, uh, which was once thought to be heretical. But now let's talk about Earth-like planets. First of all, aren't they really hard to find, given the fact they're tiny compared to uh, a Jupiter-sized planet? Well, astronomers have taken a new tack, a kind of, we call it, race to the bottom. And that is that Earth-sized planets are really hard to find, but if it's a really, really, really small star, it's not too hard to find. Yes, and uh, let's now talk about the recent discovery, which made headlines. Seven, count them, seven Earth-like planets orbiting a dwarf star uh, 38 light years from the planet Earth. How unusual is that? Well, it's the first we've ever found, which is why it made such big news. And even though we don't know if they're Earth-like at all, they're definitely Earth-sized. And having seven Earth-sized planets is just astonishing. And... <laughs> And by Earth-like, do you mean Earth-like in terms of size or Earth-like in terms of having an Earth-like atmosphere, like perhaps liquid oceans? What do you mean by Earth-like? Well, we mean earth size, and honestly, we should really only say earth size and not Earth-like at all, because we don't know what they're like. We have no idea what they're like. They're earth size. You know, if you think about it, they could be completely devoid of an atmosphere. They could be like Mercury or in our wildest dreams, they could be like Earth, with liquid water ocean and with air to breathe. So we have no idea what they're like. At this point, we only know that they are earth size. Okay. Now, therefore, given the fact that we have this encyclopedia of exoplanets, is it possible to get a more or less a census? That is, what fraction of the stars in the heavens have planets going around them, Jupiter-sized planets, and what fraction of the stars in the heavens might have Earth-sized planets? So is it possible to have a census of the Milky Way galaxy? Well, it's going to be hard to get a very detailed census because in some types of stars we can find some types of planets. Other types of stars we're stuck with other types of planets. But we do definitely try to make estimates of what's out there. Okay, so let's say you take a look at the night sky tonight. You go outside, look at the night sky. What fraction, again, this is plus or minus, but what fraction of the stars would have uh, large Jupiter-sized planets going around them? Okay, I don't know if I actually have a number for you, so let me think if I can just guess. 
Uh, let me think for a second. Because what you have to understand is, and I have to do a little technical talk here, but <laughs> you know, right. our survey, the problem is our surveys are woefully incomplete. You know, it's not like our U.S. census where if you don't respond mm-hmm. in the written mail, someone will knock on your door over and over again. We don't have that. And so most cases we just can't assess. And for Jupiters in particular, in a Jupiter-like orbit, we just, we just really aren't there yet. Uh-huh. I think it's easier if you want me to be able to say something relatively robust that we actually okay. think that all stars have planets. That if you look up in the night sky, you might not know you know how many have which type of planet, but we do think that they all have planets. So in other words, there's a good chance that close to close to 100%, not exactly, but close to 100% of the stars we see at night probably have some kind of planets going around them. Is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm saying that. That's right. Amazing, amazing truly amazing. idea, you know, that any, that when you walk outside, hopefully night's clear tonight. And, yeah, you can just wonder what's out there. Okay. Then the big question is, again, this is just ballpark figure. We don't need an exact figure. But what fraction of these stars may have Earth-sized planets going around them? Of course, it's going to be a fraction of the total number, but approximately like 1 in 20 uh, of the stars at night would have pl- Earth-sized planets going around them. We could say something like that. We're really, that, believe it or not, astronomers fight about those numbers <laughs> because <laughs> we're not entirely sure. Our data is not good enough, and we often have to extrapolate. Uh-huh. So we have to say how many do we see versus how many are really out there. So we don't have an exact number, but sure, you could you could take that. Right. Okay. Well, let's take a short commercial break, and after the break, we're going to continue our discussion of extrasolar planets. Who's out there anyway? When you go out in the night sky, is anyone looking back at you from outer space? Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. With us today is Professor Sarah Seeger, Professor of Planetary Science and Physics at MIT, author of a number of books, including Exoplanets and Exoplanet Atmospheres. And we're talking about something that was once considered science fiction. I remember when I was a kid learning about the solar system, that perhaps our solar system, well, it was the only one we knew of. Perhaps we were the only ones in the universe, or perhaps maybe the universe was teeming with copies of our solar system. Now we realize that we're the oddball. Our solar system doesn't look like anything of the thousands of solar systems that we've seen in outer space. And with us today to help explain all this to us is Professor Sarah Seeger, Professor of Planetary Science and Physics at MIT, and winner of the MacArthur Genius Award in 2012. And also, Time Magazine chose her as one of the 25 most influential figures in space in 2012. Well, Professor Seeger, where we last left off, we were talking about the discovery of seven seven Earth-sized planets going around a star, perhaps about 38 light years from the planet Earth. But, however, a few months before that, there was another discovery that the closest star to the Earth, that is uh, Proxima Centauri, has an Earth-sized planet going around it as well. Wasn't that exciting, realizing that the closest star that we know of to the planet Earth also has an Earth-like planet going around it? It's absolutely phenomenal. Who would have thought that after all those years of wondering about planets, there's one around our very nearest star? And that, in turn, of course, has stimulated some interest that one day, who knows when, uh, decades, centuries from now, one day we may be able to visit one of these star systems. And I guess that'll be one of the first choices because it's the closest star to the to the Earth, and there's an Earth-like, Earth-sized planet going around it, right? That's right, Definitely. 
Okay, now let's talk about atmospheres. Uh, as you mentioned, some of these planets that we're discovering could be Mercury-like. That is so hot and barren, there's no possibility of life as we know it. Others could be teeming with life, like, uh, like the planet Earth. So the question is, how do we know what kinds of atmospheres these planets have, and how long before we'll be able to nail down exactly which planet out there has oceans, liquid oceans? Okay, right. Well, atmospheres are everything to us, right? They're the air we breathe. They control the temperature of the planet. So we definitely want to do more about atmospheres. In fact, already, um, not these seven Earth-sized planets, but we have measured atmospheres of many exoplanets, actually, with the Hubble Space Telescope. But what's coming up in astronomy, it sounds like a long way away, but honestly, it is right around the corner, is that in the, near the end of 2018, we're going to have a more capable Hubble. It's called the James Webb Space Telescope. And we're all counting on this telescope to be able to study atmospheres of exoplanets, including some of the new exoplanets. Okay, and what are we going to look for? Are we going to look for atmospheres of hydrogen, nitrogen, or are we going to look for atmospheres of O2, oxygen, and water vapor? What are we going to look for when we look for planetary atmospheres? Well, the first thing we're going to look for is water vapor. And just a little detail is, you know, just like a skunk smell, you know when a skunk sprays and it smells so horribly? It's just a tiny bit of spray and a huge, huge smell. We have to focus on molecules that even a little bit of them make a big signature. And water vapor is actually one of those. It's a very, very strong feature. And not only that, but on a small rocky planet, water vapor is only present if there's surface liquid water. So if we can see water vapor on a small planet, Earth-sized planet, we actually can infer, we can guess that there are, have to be water oceans. This is Science Fantastic. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. In this hour, we're talking about one of the most exciting areas in astronomy, a field that didn't even exist 15, 20 years ago, and that is the discovery and the analysis of planets orbiting other stars in the universe. And as was mentioned, we're now beginning to sample the atmospheres of some of these stars, which is incredible. The atmospheres of these planets going around the one the star may be may be possible that they can harbor life. Now, uh, Professor Seeger, in journalism, they always say follow the money, follow the money when there's a scandal. Astronomers say follow the water. Why do we follow water when we're looking for the potential of intelligent life in outer space? I love that phrase. I wish we had money that we could follow. But okay, <laughs> well, we um, all life on Earth needs liquid water. So our first kind of conservative thought is we need to find a planet with liquid water before we can find one with life. But people do always say, well, why water? Well, it turns out now astrobiologists think it can be any liquid, any liquid. But it still turns out that liquid water is the most abundant liquid in the regions that we can study with our telescopes. And liquid water, I guess that's the amniotic fluid that gave rise to the first DNA. And we're, in some sense, all of us are descendants of single-celled organisms that started in the oceans, right? Right. And, okay, now, there's also an equation that astronomers sometimes use to give a ballpark estimate of the number of planets that could eventually have intelligent life on them. Uh, could you explain what that equation is, and are we getting closer to nailing down all the factors in that equation? Are you talking about the Drake equation? That's right. Yeah, the Drake equation is a famous equation written down by Frank Drake. It's more of a probabilistic argument than trying to make a prediction, prediction of what's out there. But it's amazingly true that today we are able to start to nail down the first few terms of, of the Drake equation. So we're able to, we know how many uh, stars are forming at any given time in our galaxy approximately. And we're starting to get a handle on, that was the census question, on the fraction of stars with planets. So uh, given the fact that we now have this encyclopedia 
of over 3,000 uh, planets going around other star systems. Does that mean that the Drake equation is getting a lot more credibility? I remember when I was in high school reading about the Drake equation, and some of us would snicker and say, well, you know, that's just ballpark estimates. But now we can begin to fill in some of the details there, right? Yeah, I'd say that um, the equation is meant to be an illustration, so it's not something that, you know, we program in our computers or anything like that, but certainly I'd say uh, we have this thing we call the giggle factor. You know, when someone has an idea that you just think is laughable, people laugh at it. So maybe that's what you were saying, Mm -hmm. thinking about the Drake equation. So it definitely has, uh, I won't say more credibility, but yes, we're definitely working through uh, the equations, the, the terms on the equation now for sure. It's not clear if we'll get through all of them, but we're working on it. Okay. Now, also on uh, Science Fantastic, we've had a number of people from the SETI project, and they are reputable Ph.D. physicists, except instead of giving lectures to Ph.D. students, uh, they look for alien signals from outer space. So what are your thoughts about the SETI program? Are we beginning to have candidates where we can focus our radio telescopes to listen in and eavesdrop on these conversations? Or do you think that it's a waste of money? Uh, what are your thoughts? I love SETI. I'm a big fan of SETI. I support it. It's like, why not look? You know, why would you not want to do it? I think now SETI does target stars with known exoplanets. So if astronomers find a star with small planets, SETI can go and eavesdrop in. So that's really great. Now, in exoplanets, we're not necessarily looking for intelligent life. Don't forget that. We're looking for any kind of life that produces any kind of gas that can go into the atmosphere that we might be able to detect remotely. So we're kind of working it from a very different angle from SETI. Okay, now there's a new science called exobiology, that is the biology of potential planets in outer space, uh, that used to be considered purely science fiction. But after the break, I'll ask you a little bit about what people have thought about concerning how biology may flourish in outer space far beyond the planet Earth. Okay, let's take a short commercial break. Once again, this is Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. You can always give us a call at 866-323-2129 and have your thoughts heard on national radio. And so once again, our special guest today is Professor Sarah Seeger of MIT author of books including Exoplanets and Exoplanet Atmospheres. And today we are talking about thousands, thousands of worlds orbiting other star systems many, many light years from the planet Earth. Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. With us today is Professor Sarah Seeger of MIT, author of the book Exoplanets. And we are talking about one of the greatest searches in astronomy, and that is the search for life in outer space. So, Professor, exobiology used to be considered a contradiction in terms because, of course, people had had doubts that there could even be a biology outside the planet Earth. But isn't isn't that a rather active field now where we actually look at these atmospheres of these extrasolar planets and wonder what could survive, what could thrive in these atmospheres? What are your thoughts? Absolutely, and you're right. Before, this was a crazy thing that no one worked on, and you would not believe – how many of my colleagues have been, you know, literally flooding into the field to trying to think about what is out there and what can we detect. So there's a couple things. As one is here on Earth, there are some very extreme environments like very acidic places or super dry deserts or even radioactive sites where life is found. And that gives us hope that there could be life on other worlds that might be so different from our own. Okay. The second thing we do is, yeah, we try to think about all the gases that life produces. Like when you walk into a pine forest and all those smells Those are actually gases produced by life, and we're trying to figure out which ones could we detect from far away and how sure would we be that they're produced by life and not something else. Okay, and then let me ask you a question that, well, uh, the audience always wants to know, and that is, do you personally believe that there is intelligent life in the universe outside the planet Earth? What are your personal thoughts? I absolutely believe there's life somewhere. I'm just not sure if that intelligent life is close enough for us to, you know, get in connection with. 
What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I believe they're out there. Of course, we can always debate about whether or not they're close enough to make contact with us. If they are, then, of course, they would be thousands of years more advanced than us. And maybe that's the reason why they don't visit us, because uh, we're like... We're like animals in the forest to them. I mean, we don't right, want to talk are. to the squirrels or the deer that often, right? And <laughs> right, but I can, right. But the positive note here is that we are, we are trying to enumerate how many planets Earth size are out there and in the future how many Earth-like planets are there and whether or not there are signs of life of any kind. And once we have all that, we'll be able to give a more scientific assessment of the chance for intelligent life nearby. Right. Okay. But what are your thoughts about why they don't make contact with us? Or maybe they have. But what are your thoughts about if they're out there and if they are intelligent and they have extra uh, the ability to go between star systems, how come they don't land on the White House lawn and announce their existence? Well, I'd say my first thought is that they're simply too far away and they haven't found a way around the limitations of physics to get here. That's my first thought. My second thought, if I want to just speculate, is I think they're I think we're too primitive. I think that they're just not gonna no, not gonna bother. We're not of interest yet uh, at this point. Yeah, I kind of think so too. Because if you're walking down a country road and you see an anthill, do you go down to the ants and try to talk to them, give them technology, <laughs> give them right. science, or perhaps right. you just leave they're them just, alone? Right. Yeah, the ants aren't ready for us. We we have no way to talk to them. Right. Okay. Now, also, let's talk about the future. Uh, we have the Kepler satellite out there, but it's breaking down now. You mentioned the, the Webb telescope. Tell us about the Webb and what's coming in the future. Well, one thing that you is we have a zillion ideas. We have millions of ideas. We, we want to get into space, and uh, we'd like to really um, search around all this, the ones we've talked about so far where we might be able to look for life. They're all planets orbiting very small red stars that have flares. They have a lot of ultraviolet. They're nothing like our sun-like star. We'd like to be able to get to space and directly block out the starlight so we can see earth size and Earth-like planets directly. And my favorite mission for the future is the Starshade, a giant specially shaped screen attached to its own spacecraft that would formation fly with the space telescope, but they're going to have to be separated by tens of thousands of kilometers. And that starlight would perfectly, that Starshade would perfectly block out the starlight so we could search for planets really, truly just like Earth. And what are your thoughts, parting thoughts, about this object that was discovered that eclipsed the mother star uh, Twenty percent of the starlight was reduced. People thought it was a sign of a Dyson sphere. People thought maybe the aliens are out there with a gigantic planet that can darken starlight like that. Uh, what are your thoughts? Is it just dirt in someone's telescope, or is there really evidence that something very mysterious is happening in outer space? Well, it's definitely something very mysterious. There's no need for us to put it on aliens <laughs> or, you know, mega structures. But Mitchell, think about this. The Kepler Space Telescope looked at hundreds of thousands of stars. This is like a one in a million occurrence. We've never seen anything like it. So the star remains a mystery. We just don't have an explanation for it quite yet. Okay. And what about the terrestrial planet finder and other telescopes that are going to be even better than the Kepler? Are they running out of funds or are, is well, there... They've been re yeah, they've been reinvented. Terrestrial planet finder was shelved. The name is gone and it's now replaced with things like Starshade. Starshade's uh -huh. like a new version of terrestrial planet finder. I see. Okay. Well, unfortunately we have run out of time. So, uh, Sarah, thank you so much for once again being on Science. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Michio. Okay, and once again, our special guest today has been Professor Sarah Seeger of MIT, Professor of Planetary Science and Physics. And uh, we should also point to author of a number of books, including Exoplanets and Exoplanet Atmospheres. Time Magazine shows her as one of the 25 most influential figures in space in 2012. This is Science Fantastic. Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. This is Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. On Science Fantastic, we profile the amazing, jaw-dropping scientific discoveries which are revolutionizing our world and touching our lives. And in this hour, once again, we're going to throw the lines open because this hour is your hour. Okay, moving right along, let's take the first listener phone call. Hello, Professor Kaku. My name is Stephen, 
calling from Anchorage, Alaska, listening over News Talk KFQD 103.7 and 7.50 a.m. I've got two questions, if I may submit to you, sir. One is, um, back in the 90s, and this has been bothering me for a while because we're still here, but supposedly in the 90s we had the ozone layer over Antarctica, and it was supposed to be you know, evaporating and opening wider and peeling away the protective coating of ultraviolet radiation from the sun uh, over Earth. And I was just wondering, I guess life got in the way and I missed something, but we're still here. What's the current disposition of that ozone layer? And also, the other question is, Jupiter's red spot. What a fascinating situation when you consider how that angry thing has been spinning around counter and uh, against the grain of Jupiter's terrestrial atmosphere. And it's remarkable, and I'm wondering what's the theory about Jupiter's red spot. Thank you for your time. Well, you asked two very important questions. The first about the ozone layer and whether or not it was depleted by what are called chlorofluorocarbons. And second of all, the stability of Jupiter's famous red spot. Well, as you correctly pointed out, way back in the 1990s, scientists around the world rang the alarm bells because a gigantic hole was opening up in the ozone layer above the North Pole and especially the South Pole. Now, let me explain. The sun emits tremendous amount of harmful radiation towards the Earth, but we're protected by several things. First, we have a magnetic field, a magnetic field that collimates a lot of the solar radiation down the North Pole and the South Pole, giving us the northern lights. That's why we have the aurora borealis, because the funneling of the solar radiation down the North Pole and the South Pole protects us. Second of all, of course, we have the atmosphere itself, which absorbs a lot of the radiation from out of space. But in addition to that, we have a third line of defense, and that is the ozone layer. Ozone is O3 minus. It's an ion of oxygen, and it absorbs a lot of the ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Now, without the ozone layer, a tremendous amount of X-rays and radiation would rain down on the planet Earth, making life very uncomfortable and inhospitable but fortunately, fortunately, we do have this ozone layer. Now, this is where the alarm bells went off back in the 1990s, as you correctly pointed out. We had satellites, satellites that for the first time could actually take a picture, a picture of O3 minus, a picture of the ozone layer. And we were shocked, shocked beyond imagination to realize that there was a gigantic hole, a hole opening up periodically over the South Pole. Later, we figured out it was chlorofluorocarbons used in refrigerators. It turns out that leaks in refrigerators would dissipate into the atmosphere. The chlorofluorocarbons would then interfere with the O3 minus, that is ozone, and create a hole periodically, seasonally, over the South Pole. Well, the alarm bells went off. As a consequence, we scientists met in conferences around the world told the governments what the problem was, and we convinced the governments of the world to sign the Montreal Protocols. This is historic. For the first time in human history, humans got together and said the danger is simply too great, and as a consequence, chlorofluorocarbons were largely banned. And that's why, even though it's costlier, a new kind of refrigerant was then used for refrigerators, and older refrigerators that had leaky, uh, leaky pipes had to be decommissioned and taken out of service. The good news is the acceleration of the expansion of the, of the hold over the South Pole began to stop. It didn't reverse, that is, we're not seeing a hole get smaller and smaller and smaller. But the very fact that we could reverse the degradation of the ozone layer was a tremendous victory. Now, this is not to be confused with global warming. We had a success, I repeat, we had a resounding international success with the Montreal Protocols in terms of reining in chlorofluorocarbons. But that's separate. That's separate from the whole problem of greenhouse gases, which, as you know, is controversial because the Earth is heating up 
in terms of its temperature. So we have to keep these two effects separate. They are related to a degree, but for the most part, they are separate. The first was a success story showing that the nations of the world could get together, sign the Montreal Protocols, limit the production of chlorofluorocarbons in refrigerators, and as a consequence, we see the whole not expanding and even contracting a bit. This was a tremendous victory. However, at the present time, even though now, even though now most people agree that the Earth is heating up, there's still some disagreement as to how much human activity is playing the part. And that, of course, is the whole controversy around global warming, which, of course, is yet another program on Science Fantastic. This is Science Fantastic. The most up-to-date announcements and analysis from today's technological leaders every week on Science Fantastic. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. The lines are open. Well, before the break, we had a question about Jupiter's red spot. It is rather spectacular. If you go to nasa.gov and download pictures that we've taken from the Galileo space mission and other space missions, you see this gigantic red spot hovering over the surface of Jupiter that was actually seen hundreds of years ago by astronomers, and it's stable. That's amazing, the fact that it's been stable for centuries. And the question is, first of all, is what is it, and why is it so stable? Well, the short answer is we're still a little bit confused. We really don't know why we have this red spot on the surface of Jupiter, though there have been a number of theories. Some people think that perhaps there's a gigantic storm underneath or perhaps a volcano or some kind of anomaly on the surface of uh, Jupiter that's causing the atmosphere to churn, that's causing the red spot. Other people say, no, 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 it's a byproduct of chaos theory. Chaos theory describes the atmosphere when you have trillions upon trillions of particles floating in the air. And even though Newton's laws of motion are simply not powerful enough to predict the behavior of the atmosphere, chaos theory does say that if you have a tremendous amount of spinning gas, that you will get whirls. You will get whirls inside the spinning gas. And so chaos theory says that in some sense, we expect planets like Saturn and Jupiter to have some kind of red spot. And sure enough, if you look at Neptune, there is a dark spot on Neptune, somewhat similar to the red spot on Jupiter. However, we should also point out in all fairness that chaos theory is not a predictive science. Almost by definition, we are talking about things that are chaotic. So you're not going to get a simple, clean explanation of why there is a red spot on Jupiter, other than the statement that chaos theory predicts there should be some kind of whirlpool, some kind of hurricanes on these planets because their atmospheres are made out of gas. So that's not totally satisfying. But like I said, we scientists are simply not universally converging on a theory of why we have the red spot of Jupiter. Okay, well, let's move right along and take the next listener phone call. Dr. Kaku, this is Mike calling from uh, Kennewick, Washington. I listen to you on KOMA, Radio AM, and uh, I have a question. And my question, simply put, is this. About how long would it take for an international crew of, say, a dozen people or, or any suitable number to fly out to Europa and then come back with samples and all the stuff? Is that possible? Thank you, Doctor. Well, the short answer is yes, we do have the technology to send humans way out there. We've already done it with our space probes and robots. However, uh, there's no consensus on doing such a thing. Of course, it's going to cost a lot of money, and nations have, would have to get together to 
uh, to share some of the costs. And right now, there is not too much momentum around such a mission. Such a mission, by the way, would take on the order of 10 years. Uh, we're not talking about going to the moon, which takes about three days. We're not talking about Mars, which would take about two years for a round trip t- round trip trip to Mars. We're talking about something that would be on the order of 10 years. And again, it's our robots, our robots that do this because it is quite dangerous. It's quite radioactive out there. And there's all sorts of different problems that our life support systems would encounter if we were to go that far. Now, why Europa? Europa is a moon of Jupiter, way out there in outer space, but it seems to have, this moon of Jupiter seems to have a liquid ocean underneath the ice cover. And that's what's causing all the excitement. Now, of course, some people believe that There are Martians, that Mars may sustain life. However, the only place where we see liquid water in the solar system seems to be the planet Earth, and also Europa, and maybe Enceladus, a moon of Saturn. Underneath the ice cover, there are volcanoes, and volcanoes that get the energy from tidal forces, and these volcanoes heat up the ice, and causing it to melt, giving us oceans. And if you calculate the volume the volume of water, it turns out the volume of water in these oceans is actually larger than the volume of our oceans on the planet Earth. That's amazing. That's why some people say that maybe we're barking up the wrong tree. Instead of looking for life on Mars, we should be looking for life on Europa. Now, again, before we send a uh, a manned mission to Europa will, of course, send more robots to eventually land on Europa and perhaps drill a hole, drill a hole in the ice cover and send a submarine, a submarine which will then take pictures of the ice and the water and perhaps even have evidence of some kind of sea creatures that may actually live underneath the ice cover. Well, of course, all this is speculation because right now there is no political will. There's no funding behind such a mission. But again, even if we were to create such a mission, uh, the round trip would be on the order of 10 or more years. So unfortunately, don't hold your breath. Okay, well, let's move right along to take the next listener phone call. Hi, I was wondering... If any people were to spend a long time on Mars, would Mars use would those people use their own uh, clocks and calendars, or would we synchronize them with ours? Well, you ask an interesting question because, of course, uh, there are groups now planning to go to Mars, uh, perhaps a manned mission before the year 2024, and you ask a very practical question about how you tell time. Would they have Earth clocks or would they have Martian clocks? Well, the good story is one Martian day is roughly 24 hours. That's right. One day on Mars is very similar to one day on the planet Earth. So a day on Mars is a little bit more than 24 hours. And also the seasons are also rather closely aligned with the seasons on the planet Earth. First of all, we have summer, fall, winter, spring. And why do we have that? Because the Earth is tilted, tilted by about 23 degrees as it goes around the sun. And the tilting of the Earth gives us summer, fall, winter, spring. Well, lo and behold, Mars is also tilted, also about 23 degrees. And so Mars would also have summer, fall, winter, spring. But what's the catch? There's got to be a catch someplace. It turns out that the Martian year is about twice as long as the year on the planet Earth. So there's not an exact synchronization of the day on Mars, the year on Mars, and a day on the Earth, and a year on, uh, on, on the planet Mars. Now, which calendar will they use once we have a Martian colony? That's really up to them. I would assume that they might as well get over the shock of living on another planet and adjust and adjust to the Martian calendar, even though, of course, it is slightly off from the Earth calendar. So I would imagine that the the first Martians will decide for themselves what clock they use. But again, there's a very close synchronization between a clock on the Earth and a clock on the planet Mars. Also, I should point out that the earliest the earliest we'll have for a mission, a manned mission to Mars is probably 2024, more than likely sometime in the 2030s. 
the Obama administration said that sometime in the 2030s, they expected a manned mission to Mars. But hey, SpaceX with Elon Musk thinks that they could even do it earlier, perhaps a mission by 2024. Well, who knows for sure. But it's heating up, and we'll keep you abreast of it on Science Fantastic. Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. The lines are open right now. Okay, let's move right along to the next listener phone call. Dr. Kaku, this is Clyde from Tennessee. I live in Rockwood. I've been listening to you uh, through the Apple store, the app, uh, the podcast. I just want to say I've read several of your books, and I appreciate your sharing your gift with everyone uh, and as a late learner of physics, I wanted to ask you if you would consider doing a book, maybe an online book, where uh, in order to go to the next chapter, you would have to meet certain goals to learn the basics of physics and then move on up. Maybe the last chapter could be string theory. Uh, even if you crowdfunded this, I think it would be wonderful, especially for people who are finding a renewed interest in things maybe they didn't get a chance to learn. And again, I thank you, sir, and God bless you. Well, thank you so much for giving me an idea. It's something that I'll consider. However, I should point out that I'm awfully busy right now. My book publisher keeps nagging me to write the next book. But it's something to consider. Uh, As you said, because of the Internet, because of the fact that it is possible for people to participate now with the March of Science, it's not as if you talk to a distant professor and you just get a lecture thrown at you. It's possible to have some kind of dialogue and interaction. So it's something that I'll certainly think about. But unfortunately, right now, uh, my editor keeps saying, where is the next book? So I'll be working on my next book. Okay, well, let's move right along and take the next listener phone call. Yes, Dr. Kaku. This is Roy. I listen to you on KWCB in Floresville, Texas. I have a question. When the people that are going to, let's say, to Mars or the moon, did they have any weapons with them? Thank you. Well, you ask a very important question because there are treaties, uh, treaties that ban the weaponization of outer space. We want to make sure that outer space is for everyone rather than nations which stake their flag into the soil and say, this is our territory and we're going to fight off all pretenders to it. So there is the Outer Space Treaty. It has to be revised because when you, when you look at it today, it's woefully out of date. But as we also pointed out, yes, there is going to be competition for uh, putting the flag in on c- celestial bodies. First of all, the Chinese have stated that by 2025, 2025, they want to put their flag on the moon. And, of course, other nations have stated that they also want to get to the moon. And we'll take a short commercial break. And after the break, we're going to summarize a little bit about who's going to be reaching the moon, who's going to be reaching Mars, and what do they do once they get there. This is Science Fantastic. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. On Science Fantastic, we profile the amazing, jaw-dropping scientific discoveries that are revolutionizing our world and touching our lives. And once again, the lines are open. Okay, moving right along now, let's take the next listener phone call. I wanted to know your opinion on karma and luck, somebody having like a karma luck attraction, your, your thoughts on that. Thank you. Well, you ask a very interesting question because everybody 
Everybody has asked simple questions like, is it all luck? What about initiative? What about hard work? Or is it all a matter of chance? Well, I'm a scientist. And in science, of course, we don't believe in luck or that kind of stuff. But sometimes you do wonder because some scientists are, quote, luckier than others. Why is it that some people like Richard Feynman make all these great discoveries? Is it, is it all luck or is it all skill? Well, first of all, ultimately, it's not going to be a question of luck. However, some people are consistently lucky. And I think the reason for that is not that it's in the stars, not that there's karma or anything like that, but they have a methodology, a methodology by which they strike gold more often than other people. Let's say you're a prospector, a prospector looking for gold. Is it really a question of luck? Well, yeah, in some sense, there's a lot of luck involved when you prospect for gold. But then the question is, it, why is it that certain miners are consistently lucky? And the answer is they have a methodology. They have a plan, a plan that allows them to dig where there is gold. And what is that? First of all, they dig a lot. They don't simply dig once and get tired and frustrated. They're persistent. Second of all, after a while, they begin to develop a strategy, a strategy as to which rock formation you might find gold. And so in other words, ultimately, is it luck? And the answer is, well, yeah, ultimately, there is a lot of luck involved. However, why is it that certain people are consistently lucky? And it's because they have a method. There's a method to the madness. First, they, they dig a lot. They try harder than others. They're very persistent. Second, they develop a methodology, a plan. They begin to realize that certain rock formations, well, that's where you find gold. Other rock formations, that's not where you're going to find gold. And then the other question is, what about a winning streak? Some people say, I'm hot. I'm hot today. I'm on a winning streak. I'm on a roll. Now, think about it for a moment. When you're gambling, like in Las Vegas, you have to realize that a winning streak violates the laws of science. There's no such thing as a winning streak. If you seem to be hot on a roll, it's not because the gods are aligned a certain way or the stars are aligned a certain way. It's just a matter of chance and luck. And then the question is, what about synchronicity? Sometimes people say that they're thinking about somebody and all of a sudden the phone rings and it's that person you were thinking about. And then you say, ha, I'm just not lucky, I'm psychic. I'm tuned into the mysteries of the universe because I was thinking about that person and boom, that person actually was calling on the phone. But look at it this way. How many times do you think of somebody and the phone rings and it's not that person? Or how many times you think of somebody and the phone doesn't ring at all? And then you begin to realize why hundreds of times, hundreds of times you are thinking about somebody and nobody calls. Hundreds of times you're thinking about somebody and somebody else calls, but the brain only remembers the hits. And that's the key. The brain only remembers the hits. The brain does not remember the misses. So let's take a short commercial break. And after the break, I'll talk about how you can talk to dead people. Yes, I have friends of mine who can talk to dead people. And I'll explain how you do it. And you can learn how to do it, too. Let's take a short commercial break. Because once again, this is Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Once again, the lines are open. Well, before the break, we had a question about spiritualism, about karma, about luck. And is it really all a question of luck or is there a method to the madness? And what about those people that claim psychic powers? 
These are the people that claim they can talk to dead people. You've seen them on television, and it's quite dramatic television drama. You see people crying, crying at the end of the show, stating that, yes, you've made contact with our dead relative, and we finally have closure. Our dead relative forgives us. How you do that? Well, believe it or not, I have friends of mine who, who do this. They study these people, and they realize that most of the time they have misses. Most of the time they ask questions, lots of questions, in rapid succession, and most of the time the answers are incorrect, but once in a while they get a hit. Once they get a hit, then they start to pursue that direction to get the next hit, and then the next hit. And before you know it, People are crying and sobbing, saying that, yes, 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 you've talked to our loved one. How does that work? They tell me that you can do it, too. You can train yourself to talk to dead people by, first of all, asking questions in rapid fire. And then as soon as you get a hint of a hit, you pursue that direction and ask the next series of questions. Because the human brain does not remember the misses. And that's the key. The human brain only remembers the hits. And when there is a hit, then people say, oh, my God, he's psychic. He's tuned in to the mysteries of the universe. When actually all he did was ask a lot of questions. And some of them, most of them were wrong, but a few of them were hits. And then at the end of the show, everyone cries and cries because they got what they wanted. What do people want when they get on television and they want to talk to their dead relatives? They want forgiveness. And that's what the psychic is more than happy to give them, even if he made lots of misses, even though he made lots of incorrect mistakes. Well, at the end of the show, he says, your relative forgives you. And then everyone starts to bawl and cry. So, well, that's how you do it. There's a method to the madness. So, ultimately, are some people lucky? And the answer is, well, yeah, but some people are consistently lucky, not because of the stars, but because there's a method to the madness. Okay, well, let's move right along and take the next listener phone call. Hi, this is Tom from Tampa. I listen to you on 820 Radio. My question is, can sound waves be used to disrupt a, the cohesion of a storm just as a tuning fork after being struck can cause the dry, uh, an effect with dry ice that is visible? Thank you. Well, the short answer is yes, but practically speaking, it's not practical. Yes, we scientists have seriously studied whether or not physics and advanced science can disrupt a storm because of the fact that storms can cause a tremendous amount of damage. Uh, Lives are at stake, property, people's whole livelihood is at stake. But do we have enough power to reasonably disrupt a storm? And the answer is no. When you take a look, for example, at the power of a hurricane, you realize that the power of a hurricane is many multiples of hydrogen warheads. A hydrogen bomb has the largest power pack uh, known to science that we can manipulate here on the planet Earth. And yet, it's a fraction, a fraction of the energy that you get in a storm. Now, what you suggest is somehow using some kind of sound weapon, some kind of sound weapon to disrupt the progress of a storm. And, well, yeah, in principle, if you have enough energy, you might be able to do it. But in practice, it's simply far beyond, far beyond what we can do. So sometimes people ask me, what about, uh, what about lightning bolts? Why can't we harness the power of lightning bolts? Well, in principle, you can. But again, it turns out that the power of Mother Nature is so great that if you were to try to harness the power of a lightning bolt, it literally blows out blows out most of the equipment that you have. And so Mother Nature packs a wallop, a wallop that is greater than most of the instruments that we humans can muster on the planet Earth. But that doesn't mean we haven't tried. It just means that we have been unsuccessful. Okay, well, moving right along, let's take the next listener phone call. I'm calling from WTAW. In Ryan, Texas, and my name is Dale. My question is, 
Isn't there an infinite number of causes for everything that we call effects, and yet effects are just, they can be different any time? That's it. Thank you. Well, you ask a question that goes to the very heart of science, and that is the cause and effect. And is there a relationship between them? And science says yes. But in principle, can there be an infinite number of causes for an effect? Well, before you understand the cause and effect, the answer is yes. Uh, Let's say you were to jump off a building. Uh, Most people would assume that when you jump off a building, you land on the floor. But before you do that, uh, could there be many, many effects and many, many causes? And the answer is yes. But science tells you that when you do the experiment over and over and over again, eventually there is a link, a link that allows you to establish a relationship between one cause and one effect. Of course, that is the essence of science. It's very hard. There are many, many uh, incorrect routes that you can take, but that's how science is done. Science is based on things that are testable reproducible and falsifiable that's what we call science this is science fantastic science fantastic with professor michio kaku this is science fantastic with professor michio kaku on science fantastic we profile the amazing jaw-dropping scientific discoveries which are revolutionizing our world and touching our lives and once again in this hour we're going to throw the lines open because this hour is your hour well without further ado let's now get to the first listener phone call hello professor my question is can a galaxy be sort of transported through a black hole as far as a black hole consumes an entire galaxy will it come out on another side of the black hole well yes and no first of all a galaxy consists of maybe a hundred billion stars at the center of which we usually find a black hole so you're not going to find a black hole eating up a galaxy however black holes will eat up stars for lunch and they won't even burp Entire star systems have been gobbled up by black holes, and we see this in outer space with our instruments. But eating a galaxy is too much. It's 100 billion stars. However, the other question is, is there another side to a black hole? Is a black hole a gateway to a parallel universe? Now, if you take a look at the mathematics of Albert Einstein, first of all, the mathematics predicts that black holes exist. We see them in outer space. They obey the equations of Einstein. But then the question is, what happens if the black hole is spinning? If the black hole is spinning, it doesn't collapse into a dot at all. It collapses into a ring, a ring called the Kerr metric. The ring has tremendous force, power, and centrifugal force. The centrifugal force of the ring prevents it from collapsing. In other words, you will not die when you go through a rapidly spinning black hole. In fact, you'll go to the other side, just like Alice going through a ring called the Looking Glass went from Oxford, the countryside of Oxford, all the way to Wonderland. Now, what's wrong or right with this theory? First of all, it is just a theory. The math says there should be a parallel universe on the other side of a black hole. However, quantum physicists say not so fast. These gateways, these wormholes, may be unstable. In fact, if you watch Star Trek, they often talk about wormholes, and the key thing is, are they stable? Will they contract as you're going through them and cut you in half? That'd be a horrible scenario. And the answer to that question is... We don't know. We need a quantum theory of gravity. Einstein's theories are useless when you go through the black hole. Einstein's equations simply blow up as you go through a black hole. We need a higher theory called string theory, which is what I do for a living. That's my day job. I'm the co-founder of string field theory. But the question is, the question is, How stable are these, and can string theory calculate the stability of these black holes? Unfortunately, the answer to that is not yet. On Earth, no one is smart enough to solve all the superstring equations to calculate if you can go through the black hole to the other side. Maybe somebody listening to my voice 
maybe somebody listening to Science Fantastic is going to finish the theory and calculate whether or not these wormholes are stable so you can go through a black hole to the other side of the galaxy. Maybe, maybe someone out there has the answer. Okay, well, let's move right along to the next listener phone call. Dr. Kaku, this is Mike calling from Kennewick, Washington, and I listen to you pretty regularly on KONA Radio AM. Uh, I have a question about genetics. Let's say that you were walking along someplace in Siberia and you ran across the partially decomposed skeleton of a great woolly mammoth. And would it be possible using today's cloning techniques and genetics, would it be possible to uh, bring one to life and clone a woolly mastodon like we cloned uh, Dolly the sheep? I'd like your thoughts on that. Thank you. Well, the short answer is yes. That's how fast the uh, science of paleogenetics is taking place. That is sequencing the genome of animals that are extinct. Now, I've actually spoken in Siberia. Uh, the government there in Krasnorosk actually invited me to give a talk about the future. Krasnorosk, look it up on the map, is in Siberia. And first of all, I noticed that the climate was rather mild. They tell me that because of global warming, things are warming up in Siberia, which is good for agriculture. They love it. And second of all, because the tundra and because the ice is receding in Siberia, animals that died during the ice age over 10,000 years ago are coming out of the ice. This is amazing. As the ice recedes in Siberia, as the tundra begins to thaw out, prehistoric animals that have been stable in the ice, frozen in the ice for over 10,000 years, are now beginning to thaw out. In fact, the Discovery Channel even had a special whereby a near-complete, a near-complete mammoth was found. Uh, the only part of the mammoth that was still that decayed was the top of the skull, but the entire body was near perfectly preserved. A tremendous amount of DNA was available, and scientists looking at different animals have begun to piece together the entire genome of the mammoth. Something that was once considered impossible has now been done, and that is they've been able to sequence the genes of the mammoth. And now at Harvard University, some professors there are saying, well, why not bring back the mammoth? So after the short commercial break, I'll talk about what the steps necessary to begin the process of bringing back animals that died during the last ice age. This is Science Fantastic. The most up-to-date announcements and analysis from today's technological leaders every week on Science Fantastic. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. The lines are open. Well, before the break, we had a question from a listener. Can we bring back extinct animals like the mammoth, which uh, died out tens of thousands of years ago? And the answer to that is, in principle, yes. There's a group at Harvard now which has stated that they're looking at the steps necessary to bring back the mammoth. How would you do it? First of all, you would have to sequence the genes of the mammoth, which has been done. And given that DNA sequence, you would have to cut it up and then insert insert these chunks of DNA into, into the egg of, let's say, an elephant. The elephant DNA is actually very similar to the mammoth DNA. So you insert snippets of DNA from the mammoth, taken from the mammoth, and put it into an elephant. And then the elephant gives birth to a baby mammoth. So this is incredible. And then, of course, the next question that people come uh, ask is, we've also sequenced the genes of the Neanderthal man. So what's to prevent somebody from doing the same thing with a Neanderthal and then inserting the egg into a human so that a woman would give birth to a Neanderthal? Well, in principle, it might be possible since the complete genome of the Neanderthal has been found by scientists who've analyzed several Neanderthal skeletons. But then you have a moral problem. 
The scientists at Harvard were the ones who also proposed that possibility. And the question is, what do you do? What do you do with a baby Neanderthal? Do you put it in a zoo? Or do you put it at Harvard, where it becomes a, a kid, a student at Harvard University? There are ethical questions, because the mammoth, if it's brought back to life, will have feelings. It will have thoughts. It may even be able to talk to us to a certain degree. And so where do you put it? In a zoo or in college? Think about that. Okay, well, let's move right along and take the next listener phone call. My name is Wendy. I'm listening on 820 AM Tampa. My question is, I am wondering how the dimensions, of the I believe 11 dimensions of hyperspace, how far scientists have gone theorizing and elaborating on the differences between each of those dimensions, and if they've um, theorized about different um, physical laws that pertain in each of those dimensions. Thank you. Well, the answer is yes. We theorists have spent a tremendous amount of time working out the physics of these various dimensions. But then the next question is, what about testing these theories? And what about perhaps one day accessing these things? That is where we break down. At the present time, we have no physical tests of these higher dimensions. It would take an enormous amount of energy to create a gateway to these other dimensions. But let me explain what has been done. We now believe that there was a multiverse before the Big Bang. So our universe is a bubble. It's expanding. We live on the skin of the bubble. And that's called the Big Bang Theory of Einstein. The new theory coming from string theory is that there are other bubbles out there. And these other bubbles can also have Big Bangs. They can pop into existence, go back into nothingness. They can have a Big Bang or a Big Crunch. And these other universes can be in various dimensions, going all the way up to 11. Now, because this is mathematics, we can, in principle, extract out the physical implications in each universe. And we find that these, in these other dimensions, the laws of physics are not the same. Now, you know that when we travel to distant parts of the universe with our space probes or different parts of the planet Earth, you hear the same expression. Well, the laws of physics are the same, so we expect to see the same things. We expect to see stars. We expect to see carbon-based, uh, maybe life forms. We expect to see the 100 elements or so that we've been able to analyze in the laboratory. But in string theory, these other universes in various dimensions can have different laws of physics. They could have more subatomic particles than just the electron, the proton, and the particles of the standard model. Or perhaps matter will be unstable. In fact, that's what we find. We usually find that matter is unstable in these other universes, which makes them not very interesting. Our universe is quite stable, and as a consequence, we have life in our universe because it took billions of years to get life off the ground. So each universe has its own physics coming from a master theory called string theory. So string theory becomes metaphysics. That is, it's the theory of all these lower dimensional universes. Now, believe it or not, there was a science fiction story written by none other than H.G. Wells. I think it was called The Visitor where he talked about a collision, a collision between these various dimensions. There was a, a vicar, a uh, religious priest, who was hunting one day, and he thought he shot a large bird, but instead he found out that he shot an angel. Well, of course, he was mortified. When he went to find out the object that he had shot from the sky, he found out that, well, it looked like a human with wings. It was an angel. So he was so embarrassed by this that he took the angel home and tried to nurse it back to health again secretly so no one knew. But eventually the angel became curious about what humanity was like. He said that one day he was flying in his universe, which had different laws of physics, and all of a sudden he saw this man shooting at him, and that's when he fell to earth. Well, this angel begins to inspect humanity. 
begins to wander in the marketplace, begins to see people interact, and he is not impressed at all. He, he sees people cheating other people, people lying to each other, uh, the police necessary to arrest criminals who victimize innocent people. So he's not happy at all with the state of humanity. Meanwhile, the poor priest is stuck with, a, with, with an angel in his house, and he doesn't know what to do with him. Well, I won't give away the ending. It has a rather sad ending. But the question is, can that happen? H.G. Wells writes that our universe is like a plane, but it exists with other planes of existence. And so like two parallel sheets of paper, one day they can intersect. The two sheets of paper can intersect, and that's what happened when he was on a hunting trip. For some reason, our dimensional universe intersected with another dimensional universe, and out popped out an angel. Well, is that possible? Well, in principle, yes, but highly, highly unlikely. And what does string theory say about these things? At the present time, not much. String theory predicts these other universes, but we don't have enough firepower to begin the process of going between dimensions, which would require energies comparable to that found in a black hole. And we certainly cannot play with black holes, at least not yet. Okay, let's move right along to the next listener phone call. Yes, my name is Doug. I live near Anchorage, Alaska, and I listen on um, KFQD Radio AM. I was wondering, in the... Um, a lot of the science literature, it says that um, charged particles come from the sun. Could you explain what all the charged particles are, and could you explain what uh, muons are? Thank you. Okay, we'll be glad to. Uh, first of all, the atom has no electrical charge at all because positive and negative cancel each other. But charged particles can take place when you rip atoms apart. And this could be potentially dangerous because these solar flares, one day a giant solar flare could hit the Earth and charged particles could wipe out communication. We'll talk about the Carrington event after the break. A Carrington event where cosmic rays, cosmic uh, solar flares from space, literally wipe out communication on the Earth and hurl us back centuries into the past. Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. This is Science Fantastic. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. The lines are open. Now, we had a call that came in just before the break, and that call was, well, what are charged particles from the sun? And, well, what I want to add is, potentially, they could be quite dangerous. So, first of all, what is an atom? An atom is a very tiny object such that it has an equal number of positive charges and negative charges. So, atoms, for the most part, are neutral. However, when you excite them with energy, like in the sun with tremendous heat, they're ripped apart. And when you rip apart the atom, you get ions, charged particles. Ions can either be positively charged uh, or negatively charged. Positively charged, like protons, for example, or negatively charged, like electrons or muons. Muons or mu mesons are very similar to a heavy version of electrons. They are very similar to the electrical magnetic properties of electrons, except they're much heavier, and they decay down to electrons. Now, a lot of the cosmic rays, a lot of the radiation from the sun that hits our upper atmosphere is in the form of muons. Now, is this dangerous? Well, potentially, yes. Back in 1849, there was a huge, humongous solar flare that erupted on the surface of the sun. It was cataloged by an astronomer called Carrington. He wrote about it. And several hours later, there was a gigantic disruption of telegraph wires. All of a sudden, telegraph wires that had no charge at all sprung into existence all by themselves. Messages were being sent of gibberish on telegraph wires that had no business uh, transmitting telegraph signals. In fact, in Cuba, they saw the northern lights with the, and they saw the lights with, they could read the newspaper at night with the lights coming from the northern lights in Cuba. 
Now, when was the last time you saw the northern lights in Cuba strong enough that you could read a newspaper in Cuba at night all by yourself? Incredible. Now, we physicists have figured out that if another Carrington event were to take place now, we would have very little warning, just a few hours worth, and it would wipe out communications on the Earth. First of all, our satellites are not reinforced. They're not shielded against these gigantic solar flares, so telecommunications and the Internet would be wiped out. Also, power stations on the Earth also are not shielded correctly. We don't have redundant power systems. As a consequence, power systems would also go out. And very soon, food riots would erupt because people's refrigerators would uh, lose power. And no rescue crews, crews would come in because rescue crews in neighboring cities are also wiped out in terms of electrical power. Radio, television would all be short-circuited by the solar flare. And so you would have society being thrown back 200 years into the past. We had a glimpse of this once in Manhattan where we had a, a power failure. And in Times Square, in Times Square, people could not use their credit cards. They could not check into their hotels in Manhattan. And as a consequence, there was chaos, absolute chaos at grocery stores, in hotels. People had to sleep in the lobbies of hotels in Manhattan. It was a mess. Think of what would happen if the entire country the entire Earth had the same problem. We'd be thrown back 200 years into the past. This is Science Fantastic. This is Science Fantastic. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. The lines are open. Okay, moving right along. Let's take the next listener phone call. Yes, hi. My name is Stephen, and I um, am calling from Portland, Oregon. I recently read a book by an author named Paul LaViolette. Uh, last name is spelled L-A-V-I-O-L-E-T-T-E. And the book is Secrets of Anti-Gravity Propulsion, Tesla, Unidentified Flying Objects, uh, and Classified Aerospace Technology. In that book, the author talks about <clears throat> two uh, types of technology. One of them is uh, Serral Effects Disc by John Serral, uh, S-E-A-R-L-E. And uh, that person uh, used something, uh, used magnets in a circular uh, formation and uh, anyway created something called a serial effects generator or a magnetic energy converter. I'd like to know, I'd like to hear you comment on that if you have read that book or familiar with John Serral and his work. And also there is uh, another part in there that talks about uh, gravitic technology or uh, electrostatic energy fields that are distorted with uh, dielectrics uh, to create gravity wells or gravity sinks. All this is uh, involved with uh, gravity propulsion or uh, anti-gravity propulsion. And there's a series of patents on the back, about 49 of them. This all occurred in the 40s and 50s and 60s. I'd like to know if you could comment on those two concepts, the serial effects generator and uh, electrogravitics or uh, electrostatic energy fields distorted used in uh, used for uh, transportation and so forth. Thank you. Okay, well, first of all, I get a lot of emails from different inventors, different people who try to use magnetism, gravity to solve the energy crisis, to create a new uh, way of uh, propulsion systems and so on and so forth. First of all, I tend to be skeptical of some of these claims. Uh, however, that's not to say that they're wrong. I'm simply saying that the ones that I've looked at, you can very easily see where the problem is. For example, magnetic propulsion. Uh, magnetism is quite good to separate North Pole from other North Poles. That's why we have maglev trains. 
trains that can actually float on a small cushion of magnetism. But magnetism cannot be used to push the magnetic car. It's simply used to uh, make the magnetic car float. Uh, for example, if I have large magnetic fields and make them, make them vibrate or move and so on and so forth, what happens is that objects rotate. Uh, compass needles rotate. Uh, iron filings will rotate. They won't, they won't have a net motion. They'll simply spin and they'll simply rotate. In fact, that's why we have motors. That's why we have generators. They all spin. And that's ideally suited for magnetic energy. So magnetism ideally is used to make objects spin. And that's why we have hydroelectric dams. That's why we have nuclear power plants. They use the fact that, that for example, steam power can be used to make an object spin in a magnetic field, and that can create electricity. However, to use this as a propulsion system would violate the laws of Maxwell. James Clerk Maxwell, in around 1860, around the time of the American Civil War, worked out what are called Maxwell's equations. These are the equations governing electromagnetism. That's how we can build radio and microwave generators without ever having to build a prototype. We have Maxwell's equations. They give us a perfect description of electromagnetic waves. And in Maxwell's equations, at least the equations that we've looked at so far, you cannot use them as a net propulsion system. Magnetism will make objects spin, but not make objects move in a straight line. Okay, let's take a short commercial break, and afterwards I'll talk about anti-gravity. That's a staple of science fiction, but how close are we to harnessing the power of anti-gravity? Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. The lines are open. Well, the previous caller asked a lot of questions. I can't possibly answer all of them. And, uh, for example, I have not had a chance to look at the blueprints for some of the designs. However, people have sent me the designs of their particular generator. And I see that they make a mistake. And that is Maxwell's equations, the equations which govern electricity and magnetism, do not allow for a net generation of linear kinetic energy. They make objects spin. And that's why we have electric motors and electric generators. They do not move objects. So that's why, for example, on your bicycle, you have a generator, a little generator that has a magnet which spins. And that's what magnets are good at, spinning. But you cannot use this to generate uh, mo motion in a linear direction for your bicycle, okay? Magnetism by itself will not do that. You have to use magnetism to create electricity. And then electricity can be used, for example, in an electric car to push an object in a linear direction. So you have to go through this intermediate stage of electricity, but magnetism by itself will not make objects move in a straight line. Now, what about anti-gravity? Well, first of all, we have antimatter. Antimatter does exist. We create beams of antimatter at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland. In fact, when I was in high school, I played with antimatter. Uh, antimatter is naturally given off by certain chemicals like sodium-22. With a cloud chamber, you can actually prove that antimatter is coming out of your uh, radioactive light source and radioactive source. And that's actually what I did when I was in high school. And I went to the National Science Fair with that science experiment. Now, anti-light is light. So there's no such thing as anti-light different from light. Same thing with anti-gravity. Anti-gravity anti is gravity. Gravity is its own anti-particle. Now, it is possible to counteract the force of gravity using magnetism, and that is the maglev train. However, a hoverboard... A hoverboard like what we see in the movie Back to the Future, that's awfully hard to do with the magnets we have today. Superconducting magnets, you would have to have a lot of them to create anything that resembles the hoverboard found in the movie Back to the Future. So in other words, anti-gravity is gravity. 
but you can use magnetism to make objects float and give the appearance of anti-gravity, but it's not really anti-gravity. Anti-gravity is literally the opposite of gravity, and in quantum mechanics, we realize that anti-gravity is ordinary gravity, just like anti-light is light. Okay, well, let's move right along to the next listener phone call. Hey, this is Jim from Portland, Oregon. My question is this. Uh, I read in a book on science that in the, in the fraction of a second after the universe was created, the Big Bang, the universe expanded, I think it was 100 billion miles across. And my question is, if this is true, if, first of all, is it true? And if it is true, how could it have expanded so much faster than the speed of light? Thank you very much. Well, you ask a question that a lot of people have puzzled over, and that is, well, the Big Bang expanded very rapidly, in fact, faster than the speed of light. But then people say, but I thought Einstein said that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Well, not quite. It turns out that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Yes, nothing is empty space. Empty space can stretch. Empty space can stretch faster than the speed of light. So you see, Einstein is all right. Nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Nothing being space, empty space. Empty space can expand faster than the speed of light. So a more correct formulation of Einstein's famous statement would be that material objects, material objects cannot go faster than the speed of light. But empty space is not material. Empty space, of course, is empty. However, empty space is the, a fabric, a fabric called space-time continuum, and that fabric can stretch faster than the speed of light. So there's no contradiction with the laws of Albert Einstein. Einstein still has the last laugh when it comes to the ultimate velocity in the universe. Okay, let's move right along to the next listener phone call. Professor, this is Joe from Akron, Ohio. I once heard that there, that everything around us is made of atoms, everything. So does that mean that everything is living? Uh, well, the short answer to the question is no. Uh, first of all, everything we see around us on the Earth is made out of atoms. In outer space, we have dark matter, which is not made out of atoms, but that's a whole other story. But the atoms we see around us uh, make up the chemical elements, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, things like that. And these atoms, in turn, can create DNA. And DNA carries the blueprint of life. So the relationship between atoms and life is atoms can create molecules. One particular molecule is DNA, the famous double helix. That contains information. And cells are bunches of, of atoms that, that encircle the DNA, protecting it. And we are made out of cells. These cells have a blueprint and an instruction to go with it. And that instruction is given to us by, the, by atoms as well. Well, unfortunately, we run out of...